Hello, I'd like to welcome you again as we continue in our study in the book of Exodus. Let's look to God in prayer. Father, we come to you because we realize that we are in great need of having our eyes opened and having an understanding to be able to see the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Exodus. Help us to do this today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, please follow along in your Bibles as I begin reading in Exodus chapter 2, verse 15. Now, when Moses heard this thing, he sought to slay, sorry. Now, when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now, the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And then when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, How is it that ye are come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, And where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses Zipporah, his daughter, and she bare him a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. Now, in our last study, as we were looking at this passage here, we saw Moses went out this second day in Egypt, and he came across two Hebrews who were fighting with each other. They were striving and fighting, and one was wrong and one was in the right. But this was so surprising to Moses because he had already seen how the Hebrews were in this terrible oppression from the Egyptians. I mean, their sufferings alone should have united them, should have drawn them together into an echadness together. But the verse in Acts 7.25 summed up what happened when Moses attempted to deliver these two Jewish people, what happened and he, by, by killing, by first he killed the Egyptian and then he tried to deliver the, the, uh, this Jewish person who was being oppressed by the other Jewish person. But in, when it came to the part of the first day when Moses went out and killed the Egyptian, seeking to deliver in this first step the Jewish people from the Egyptians, Acts 7.25 says it like this. For he, that's speaking of Moses, he supposed his brethren, that's the Jewish people, would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them but they understood not. Moses knew that he was God's appointed deliverer of the Jewish people. He knew that. And, be, and since he knew that he was God's appointed deliverer, he thought in his mind that he, he thought that they would understand, that they would also know that he was God's appointed deliverer. He supposed was the word that was using, used in Acts 7. He supposed that his own Jewish people would have understood that he was God's appointed deliverer. But his own Jewish people did not understand. Sound familiar? Sound familiar with the Lord Jesus Christ? We see how Moses was like the Lord Jesus Christ in this situation. Who, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, when he came to his own Jewish people, he found, the Lord Jesus Christ found, what it says in John 1, 11. He, this is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, he came unto his own, that's the Jewish people, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. They rejected him, very much like what happened to Moses. So what was said about Moses could have been said about the Lord Jesus Christ. Like Moses, the Lord Jesus Christ knew that he was God's appointed deliverer. He was God's Messiah. He was the Mashiach of Israel to deliver the Jewish people. And like Moses, the Lord Jesus Christ thought 
that his own people also knew that he was God's appointed deliverer. And so like Moses, the Lord Jesus supposed that his own Jewish people would have understood that he was indeed God's appointed deliverer. Moses was really just one in a long line whom God sent to the Jewish people, which finally included his son, God the Son, who was sent by God the Father to the Jewish people. And Moses and all of them in this line, including the Lord Jesus the Messiah, found the very same thing that the Lord Jesus described in Luke 13, 34, when he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. See, with those words that were spoken to Moses, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? With the word who, they rejected the authority of Moses, just as the Jewish people rejected the authority of the Lord Jesus in Matthew 21, 23, when it says, And when he was come into the temple, the chief priest and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? With those words, to Moses, who made thee a judge and a prince and a judge over us, they rejected the authority and the rulership that Moses had over them. And with those words, that's why those words were very important when that man said that to Moses, who made thee a prince and a judge over us over us expressed how the Jewish people did not want Moses to be over them. And the Lord Jesus Christ described in a parable how he was received or not received. And in that parable, he describes, the Lord Jesus describes a king that was far away from his kingdom. And he said, to his, he said that his servants sent a message back to him. In Luke 19, 40, 19 14, he reads like this, this is what the Lord Jesus said, but his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. The very short description of the Lord Jesus Christ that applies also to Moses and how they were both received by their own Jewish people is really summed up best in John 1.11. He came unto his own and his own received him not. In other words, it was the push away. That statement, that verse is the pushback. It's the push away statement of those words. And that just superimposes right on Exodus 2.14, who made thee a prince and a ruler and a judge over us? And it became true of Moses that he came unto his own and his own received him not. And it became true of the Lord Jesus. He came unto his own and his own received him not. Verse 15, we found that Moses sat down by a well. And as we look again at Moses sitting, by, sitting down there by that well in the land of Midian, Moses had just run for his life. That's what he's doing. He'd run for his, for his life. He was exhausted. He was emotionally drained. All the drama of it all. And he's sitting down there by that well in the land of Midian. And, and, and he finds himself in a strange place as he sat down there. And so in verse 15, he's sitting down by the well. He's a man in exile. He's just like Jacob. When Jacob fled from his brother Esau, who had vowed to murder him, Moses had fled from Pharaoh, who had vowed to murder him. And like Moses, Jacob, Jacob also came to a well in a foreign land. And when Jacob was at that well, God encouraged Jacob by bringing Rachel to that well, the woman that eventually Jacob ended up marrying. Just like Rebekah, Isaac's wife was identified also at a well by Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, when he was on his mission, having been sent by Abraham, to go find a wife for Isaac. Now Moses, 
At this well, he sees seven women, and they're working hard. It says that in Exodus 2, 16, it identifies them. It says the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And so what happens? In verse 17, the shepherds came. They drove the women away. Moses stood up. He helped them. He watered their flock. So when Moses saw these shepherds come and drive the seven daughters of the priest of Midian away, something again triggered inside of Moses. That was not right for them to be driven away, and this triggered in Moses. This was, this was, this was not just for them to be driven away. Moses stands up, and he defends these daughters, and it says he helps them, and he waters their flock. Now, why did he do that? Why did Moses come to the help of these women? Why did this injustice trigger something in Moses to make him have to be impelled to help these daughters? Why? Because Moses had a gift, a gift from God. He loved doing justice. Moses loved defending the injured party. He felt compelled to. On that first day back in Egypt, when he went out in verse 11 and saw the Egyptian beating the Hebrew, Moses' sense of justice triggered inside of him when he saw that, and Moses confronted and killed the oppressor, the Egyptian, and he rescued the Hebrew that was being beaten. On the second day, when Moses went out, in verse 13, again, it's he saw one of the Hebrews doing wrong to another Hebrew, and again, that sense of justice triggered inside of Moses. And what does Moses do? He confronts the Hebrew doing wrong by questioning him, why was he doing that? And you see here in the words of verse 17, the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flocks. So now again, Moses' sense of justice triggers inside of him, and he stands up, and he confronts the shepherds, and he helps these daughters, the priest of Midian, and waters their flock. So here Moses is like Jacob, who also helped Rachel by, at that time, uh, Jacob rolled the stone away from, from the well's mouth so that he could water the flock that uh, Rachel had. But what we're talking about here is the gift that Moses had from God. He just could not help himself but to see the underdog, to feel the pain of the underdog, to stand up for the underdog, to confront the oppressor and help the underdog. That was Moses. That's what he had inside of him. And that's the passion that will also drive Moses to want to return to Egypt to free the underdog, which in this case was his own people, enslaved Israelites. Now, from verse 18, we see that this man, the priest of Midian, had seven daughters, and they just left Moses at the well after he did that. See, in verse 18, when they came to Reuel, their father, he said, how is it that you come so soon today? That must have been a, uh, uh, and then he asked them, why did you leave him at the well? It must have been a very lonely time for Moses. Can you imagine? I mean, this is a, here he's done this, uh, he did this for the first Hebrew in the first way, and what thanks did he get? He gets reported, perhaps, to, to everybody that, uh, that, that he has killed an Egyptian. He does this for the, for the other Hebrews fighting together, and what thanks does he get? He gets, a, he gets it right in his teeth. Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? He does this now for the daughters, and what thanks did he get? I don't know if they got any thanks at all. They just left him there, so much so that the father was surprised. So it must have been a really lonely time, a really hard time for Moses. I mean, and, you know, <clears throat> when he was back in Egypt, that cost him something. It cost him his uh, Egyptian, uh, you might say his citizenship. I mean, he made enemies from the Egyptians. It cost him something here in his new place, in the land of Midian. He had just made enemies of the shepherds, and because... And, and those that, it, that he'd help, well, they're just off. So that seemed to be for Moses just a repeat of what had happened back in Egypt. 
These shepherds were like the Egyptians. They were now his enemies. The daughters were like the Hebrews with the who made thee a judge and a ruler over us. Very, very hard time for Moses. We can feel his loneliness. We can feel his sense that he's being isolated there. And he sits down isolated. We can imagine Moses wondering, what is ever going to happen to me? But Moses did not know He did not know how God was already taking care of him because when those daughters came back so soon in verse 18, their father begins to ask questions that will turn to benefit Moses and bring him home. So from their reply, it's interesting in verse 19, when the daughters reply to their father, they say they call Moses an Egyptian delivered us up out of the hands of the Hebrews and drew water for us. Now, then God worked in the heart of the, of the Father in verse 20, and he said unto them, Where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he made bread. So from verse 20, we can see how, again, it's emphasized that Moses was just left there at the well when he said, How is it that you have left the man? And when their father told them to return and call them, they must have found Moses just where they left him at that well. Probably didn't know where to go, what to do. And so in verse 21 is really the beginning of a turning point for Moses. It's really a turning point for Moses when it says in verse 21, Moses was content to dwell with the man and he gave Moses Zipporah, his daughter. So now Moses finally finds a home where he's welcomed and he can now relax. It says he's content in the home of this priest of Midian. Those words, Moses was content to dwell with the man. Those are very, very important words because they tell us that finally Moses has emerged from this life of internal conflict and turmoil. You know, before this, when Moses was living in the Pharaoh's palace, we know, as we've studied from Hebrews 11, 24 through 25, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So what we know from those verses about Moses' life is that there were two factors in Moses' life in in, in the palace that just irritated Moses. They got under his skin. They took away his peace. They left him disturbed and tormented, so much so that he was constantly in no peace. And he was disturbed in the palace because first, it was where Moses was with a title that took all his peace away. Whenever Moses was introduced to someone, Moses was introduced, and here is Moses, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Whenever Moses was referred to, he was referred to as Moses, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he just couldn't stand it any longer. He couldn't take it any longer. He was not in his mind, an Egyptian. He was a Hebrew. He wanted to be a Hebrew. He did not want to be referred to as an adopted Egyptian, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He didn't want it anymore. So when it says in verse 21 that Moses was content to dwell with the man, it means that in this man's house, Moses would never be referred to as the daughters referred to him, and that must have irritated him. In verse 19, as an Egyptian, it means that in this man's house, Moses would never be referred to as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And from this great relief to no longer being called an Egyptian, or worse, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, Moses was now free. And Moses found contentment. And second, it was where Moses was not. He was not with the Hebrews. He was not with the people of God when he was in the palace. And Moses was not even even now. He was not yet with the people of God. But at least now, Moses has found a little hiding place. Moses has found a little sanctuary. Moses has found a little home in a strange land, and he will stay in this man's home for 40 years. And this will become a very valuable time in Moses' life. 
Egypt was a noisy place. Egypt with the business of the palace and Moses was occupied with his military education and all the duties that he had being heir to become the next Pharaoh as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But now it's all changed now. It's all different. And here in Midian, it's quiet for Moses, especially as he goes on to the backside of the desert to feed these sheep. And Moses will learn here how to talk to God. He will learn in this state of quietness how to hear God. And so we see in verse 21 through 22 that the man, it says, he gave Moses Zipporah, his daughter, and she bare him a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I've been a stranger in a strange land. So Moses gets a wife, Zipporah, and Moses gets a son. And we might think that now that Moses has gotten a wife, and now he'll be happy, and now he'll, he'll find peace. Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. I still remember when, when the um, sister of Barbara Streisand was interviewed, she said, oh, I hope that Barbara at last will find happiness and peace. It kind of reminds me a little bit now because you think, well, Moses has a wife now. He's got a son, so maybe at last now he'll find happiness and peace. And the, the wife gives him a son, and we might think that now that Moses has a son, he's going to be happy. He's going to find peace. But something occurs, and it's, it's in this name that Moses gives to his son that really reveals the heart of Moses. Verse 22, And she bare him a son, and he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. So we find here that Moses, he didn't go to a book of baby names to find a cute-sounding name for his son. Moses gave a lot of thought to the name that he chooses for his son. This wasn't an off-the-cuff type name. And Moses chooses a very special name for his son with, for a very pressing reason that caused him to choose that name for the son. And the name that Moses chooses for his son is, as we see, the name Gershom. Moses chooses his name Gershom for his son because this name, express the deep feeling in Moses' heart. The name Gershon is what Moses wants to say about himself. Gershom is like a confession of Moses' heart. So to understand what Moses is communicating and, and understand how Moses is feeling, we need to know exactly what does the name Gershom mean. Now, the name Gershom means foreigner or refugee, but, but Gershom is a very graphic word because the Hebrew root for the word Gershom comes from the root word garash. And garash means in Hebrew to drive out or to expel or to thrust out or to divorce. In fact, it is translated as divorced in the Bible. So the root of the word Gershom means to be driven or thrust out as when an angry husband who wants to divorce his wife drives or thrusts her out of his home. And that wife can say when she's been thrust out and thrown out of the house, she can say, Gershom, I've been driven or thrust out of my home. That's the root word behind Gershom. That's the root meaning of the word Gershom. And this is the meaning that Moses wants to express in the naming of his son when he names him Gershom. So we can ask the question, why would Moses choose a name like this? It's such a, a strong name. It's such a rough name for a son as Gershom. And so Moses goes on to elaborate and to explain to us why, what he meant by naming his son Gershom. And Moses' explanation for why he has chosen this very strong name for a son Gershom is found in verse 22 when he said, he said, I, I have been a stranger in a strange land. So what Moses is saying here is, I named the boy thrust out as in divorced away because I've been thrust out or divorced away from my people. And now I find myself a stranger, a foreigner in a strange land. 
And that's one rough name for one little boy. Can you picture going to the little boy, say, hi, little, little fella, what's your name? My name is thrust out as a divorced woman is thrust out of her house. Oh, you say to the boy, was that both your mom and dad's idea to name you just name you that, or was that just your mom's idea or just your dad's idea? And the little boy said, that was just my dad who named me that. And then we'd ask the question, why did your father give you that name? And the little boy says, because my dad wanted everyone to know that he had been thrust out from his own people and that he ended up being a refugee in a foreign country. That's a very strong message that Mr. Moses here is sending to the world through the naming of his son Gershom because Moses felt so much like he was thrust out or divorced away from his own people into being a stranger in a strange land, that Moses wanted to memorialize this so that even after Moses died, the memorialization of his feeling through the name of his son Gershom would go on continuing to speak of how Moses felt. I wonder how Moses' wife felt, Zipporah, about this, giving her son this name. I wonder if she and Moses had the uh, what am I chopped liver type of conversations. You know, I wonder if she said to Moses, don't I get to say so in the naming of our son? Well, whatever conversation took place between Moses and Sipra, the boy ends up with the name Gershom. Poor kid. But the name Gershom is also very important. It's important for us because it gives us an insight into the heart of this man who God said was the meekest man on the earth, God said is my friend, and God defended even against Moses' own sister and brother later on, we're going to see. So the name Gershom is a life confession for Moses. The name Gershom not only describes the history of Moses' life up to this point, being there in the land of Gideon, Midian, but the name Gershom is like a prophecy for the future of Moses' life. All of Moses' life can be summed up with the word Gershom. Moses could say about himself, just call me Moses the Gershom. The name Gershom is a good description of the way Moses just felt his whole life on earth was. I mean, throughout his life, Moses felt like Gershom. Moses the Gershom, ever the one being thrust out and ending up as a stranger in a strange land. Moses could say, just look at my name, Moses. Not even a Hebrew name, an Egyptian name. Why? Because I was the Gershom, the one thrust out by my people and living as a stranger in a strange land of Egypt. Moses felt like Gershom when he lived in Pharaoh's court, a stranger in a strange land. He said he would say, I'm no son of Pharaoh's daughter, till finally the Egyptians thrust him out. Moses felt like Gershom living in a stranger in a strange land with this pagan priest now in Midian. And Mel Moses felt like Gershom living with his wife, Zipporah, who hardly understood anything about the circumcision, as we'll see later on. And after Moses rejoins his people and leads them, we'll see many times when his own people wanted to kill Moses. And during those times, Moses, even among his own people, Moses felt like Gershom, a stranger in a strange land. So Gershom for Moses is really like a sigh, a continual sigh of Moses' life. We, we could call it the Gershom sigh of Moses' life. And whenever Moses really took a good look at, what, at, at this God-rejecting world that he, was in, that he was in, and everything that this God-rejecting world was offering to Moses, all his temporary glamour, its tinsel, and his temporary riches, Moses would think, this world really doesn't have anything of interest to me. And Moses would give out his Gershom side. 
And whenever Moses saw the bold, God-defiant, rebellious sins among the Jewish people and the Gentiles, Moses would feel like he didn't really belong among people, whether Jew or Gentile, who didn't love God. And in those times, Moses would breathe out his Gershom sigh again. And Moses died, finally, and with a final Gershom sigh. And God heard so many times when Moses breathed out this Gershom sigh. And so for his final hours on earth, God and Moses take a walk and they walk up a hill called Mount Nebo. And that's where God shows him two promised lands. The first promised land of <clears throat> in Canaan, that he would not enter into, and the promised land of heaven that he would enter into. And that's where Moses breathed out his last Gershom sigh when he died and God buried his body. But Moses' trademark of this Gershom sigh was not only the trademark of Moses, the Gershom sigh is the trademark of every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, or it should be, because it describes Moses and others who died in faith in Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, where it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That means they all had the trademark Gershom sigh. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. See, everyone, everyone who yearns for God, who really wants God from his heart, the righteous and holy God, and he's yearning for it. He looks at the sin in this world. He looks at the, the world, what the world finds acceptable, which is not at all acceptable with God. And that believer breathes out, like Moses, the Gershom sigh. And God heard the Gershom sigh of Moses. And God hears everyone who breathes out a Gershom sigh. And he's prepared a place for Moses and for all who breathe this Gershom sigh, he says he's prepared a place for them which he calls in his father's house in John 14. Now we read in verse 23, and it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried and they a cry came up unto God by reason of, their bond, of the bondage. Notice how it says in verse 23 that there was in the process of time. That's a great phrase. That's an important phrase. The process of time. It's, it, it teaches us that time is a process. The process of time. How long was the time? Acts 7.30 tells us. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness in Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush, which we'll read about in the next chapter. So the time period here, this process of time, the, the amount of time is 40 years. And what process happened during that 40-year period? Number one, in Egypt, we're told that the king of Egypt died. Okay. Number two, with Moses, Moses felt more and more out of place, more and more separated from his Jewish people that he knew he was called to deliver. And for the Jewish people, the process of time was also working with them because in the, pr the process over this 40-year period was to make the Jewish people feel their bondage more and more untenable, more and more severe. Their, their bondage became, the, the, the process of time made their bondage feel more and more long. And it was clear to them as they looked at this that there was no way out of their bondage. You, that were, they were in despair. They had no hope. So that now they're really crying out to God because of the process of time. All of that happened over the process of time. The process of time brought about a humility in Moses. When Moses was in Egypt, he thought that he was a somebody. 
But after 40 years in Midian, Moses had developed into a humble man because of the process of time. The process of time brought about this humility in Moses. But the process of time also brought about a humility in the Jewish people as now they are crying to God. God uses a process of time to, as he humbled Moses, as he humbled the Jewish people, and he uses the process of time to humble us. And that's described for us in 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7, where we read, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. First, we're told a principle in verse 5. God resisteth the proud and gives grace to the humble. Then there's like unwritten words between verse 5 and verse 6, which are like, so therefore, so you should, so this is how we should live, because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble, so therefore we need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. In other words, we need to look at the bad, what we call bad circumstances, hard times, terrible situation, and we need to look at that as, and say, that's nothing more than the mighty hand of God. No second uh, reason, second causes. That's the mighty hand of God. And that's a choice that we have. Whether we will stiffen up and not see it as the mighty hand of God, but get angry with man and, and say, I'm going to fight my way out of this. And, or if we'll see as what has happened to us as the mighty hand of God and humble ourselves under it. Then we're told, therefore, that we should humble ourselves so that God can exalt us, bring us out of it, in due time. Those last three words are very, very important. In due time, in verse 7. The last three words, in due time. That means God has a process of time. And during that time, He's doing His work of humbling us so that He can exalt us and waiting out the due time, waiting out the process of time, waiting out the due date, even for a pregnancy, is very difficult. And we get anxious during that time. And God knows we get anxious during that time. So that's why verse 7 says that we are to cast all our care on him, for he careth for us. We are to cast all our anxiety on God, for he is anxious for us. I'm sorry, I think when I said the last three words uh, in due time, they're really in the last three words of verse 6, not verse 7. Now, <clears throat> we come now to verse 23, and we read in verse 23 that the bondage has gotten so bad for the Jewish people that they sighed. It says the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And that can be viewed as like a first step in the humbling process. It's called the sighing phase. And everyone will sigh from a difficult time. Everyone will sigh from a terrible thing that has happened. But the children of Israel did not stop with just sighing. And that's why the rest of the verse is so important when it says, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. That's the goal that God has from the hard times. The, it's to drive us to himself. That was the goal that God had through Israel, through the Egyptian trouble, as he said in Exodus 19.4, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. God's goal for Israel was to, through the bondage, to bring them unto himself. God's goal for us is to, through the hard times, bring us unto himself. It's all about being brought to God. And when Israel let their bondage drive them to God so that they cried to God, then they were on the road to being brought to God. 
And we, we, when we let the hard times in our life drive us to God, that we cry to God, then we're on the road to being brought to God. And God wants that because God wants to receive us unto himself. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ said that the ultimate goal for us is to be brought to himself when he says in John 14, 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So if Israel only would have sighed and not cried to God, she would have been tragically fallen short. It would have been a tragedy, and it will be a tragedy for us if all we do is sigh and not cry to God. If all we do is lament and mourn for our circumstances without crying to God, that's a tragedy. That's why the progression of intensity is so important in verse 23. Israel sighed by reason of their bondage, then they went to the next step. They cried, and their cry came unto God by reason of their bondage. That expresses a progression of intensity. And God wants the hard times in our lives to carry us through the progression of intensity. And this progression of intensity is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ expressed in Matthew 7, 7 and 8, when he said, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Can you see the progression of intensity in what he's saying here? It's, it's, it's getting more and more intense. Ask, but don't stop with asking. Seek, but don't stop with seeking. Knock. And each one of those words expresses a next level, an increase in the intensity of, of, uh, 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 of, of the progression here. And when we have a really bad problem, a problem that just can drive us into the depths of discouragement, the first thing we do is the ask step. In the ask step, we ask God for help. We ask him to take away the problem. We ask him to remove this. We ask him to reverse this. We ask him to turn it around. And then the problem doesn't go away because God doesn't want it to go away. The problem is not removed because God does not want to remove it. And God does not want to remove it because he wants us to go on in the progression of intensity to go on to the next step and the next step from the ask step is the seek step. See, the ask step, ask step is for something, do something. The seek step is for someone. See, that's why the Lord says, seek ye the Lord may he, while he may be found. See, the seek step is when the problem causes us to seek the Lord Jesus Christ, to seek the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We really want to get through now to the only one who can help us, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. We must have a hearing by him. And that's expressed by the prophet Joel when he calls this in Joel 2.32, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Now we know that that name is not just God, that name is the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't just want him, we must have him. And we must have an audience with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what happens then? The problem still does not go away. Why? Because God doesn't want it to go away. The problem is not removed. Why? Because he doesn't want it to be removed. Why doesn't God want it to go away? Why doesn't God want it to be removed? Because he wants us to go to the next step in the progression of intensity. He wants us to go on to the knock step. The knock step is when we come to the special door, and it's the door that has to be opened in order to have fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when this door is open, there's an intimate relationship, an intimate friendship, an intimate fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
This was graphically seen in Revelation 3.20 where it's reversed and now it's the Lord Jesus Christ who is knocking, but he said this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. See, in this picture we see the Lord Jesus Christ standing at the door of our heart and he's knocking. And he says what the purpose of his knocking is. He says, I'm knocking because I want to come in, because I want to eat with you. I want you to eat with me. That means I want to have close fellowship with you, close friendship with you. And that's the knock step. That's the knocking where it's a knocking on the door from a desire to have fellowship with him. That's the ultimate benefit of the hard times, of the trials, of the difficult situation that come to us to drive us through the progression of intensity from the ask to the seek to the knock to get to that close fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when that happens, then we look at our, and the, it's just like the hymn says, and the things of this world grow strangely dim. Oh, the problem becomes strangely dim. The, the, the hard times, the tough situation, the impossibility to scourge, it becomes strangely dim because I've gotten fellowship, I've gotten friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what's pictured in verse 23 of Exodus 2 here. It's a progression of intensity for the children of Israel going from the sighing to the crying. And then it says in verse 23, something wonderful. It says that their cry came up unto God by reason of their bondage. Now that's wonderful that God heard their cry when he cried. And why did he hear them? Why did God hear them? Because that's just who God is. That's who, that has to do with the character of God, which is described in Psalm 22, verse 24, where it speaks about God. He hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. See, that's God. God is a God who doesn't, was, oh, affliction, oh, no, no, God turns to the afflicted one. He turns to the one who is, who is crying to him, and his heart breaks for them. And notice in verse 24, it goes on to describe, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Great couplet of words. God heard, God remembered. God heard, God remembered. God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant. God remembered his promises with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He heard the groaning and he remembered what he had said to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God made many promises. This Bible is full of the promises of God. It says in Hebrews 13, 5, For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's a promise. That's a promise of God. That's why we study the scriptures so that we can know what God has promised because when we cry, he remembers. And then it says in verse 25, he looked and he had respect. God looked upon the children of Israel and had respect unto them. That's the word yada. He knew them. God, he, he heard, he looked on them and he knew them. He recognized them. He had respect. It means that. That's so very important. Why did he, why did he, what did he see when he recognized? He recognized his people. You know, when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we gain a title that's so very important. And it's described to us in John 1, 12, where it says, but as many as received him, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. That's a great title that believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have, the sons of God, so that when we cry unto him, as in verse 25, then he looks upon us and he says, Though, that's my son, those are my sons, that's my sons there. And that's a great thing. And that's something that we need to realize because we have sonship, we can go into the presence of God, we can touch the scepter of God and live because we've been given this title, because we've received the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where we will end here today at the end of chapter 2, and then we'll begin chapter 3 with this wonderful thought. And the thought is, in receiving the Lord Jesus Christ, 
we gain the title sons of God, which gives us a great position not to be overlooked. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the word of God. Thank you for, Lord, what you teach us through the word. We thank you for the life of Moses as it's been recorded here, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the history of the Jewish people as it's been recorded here. But most importantly, we thank you for the history of you dealing with Moses, of you dealing with the Jewish people, because that tells us how you deal with us. So we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.